Yeah. No, I'm I'm good. Thank you. Catherine's coming through me after a while. All right. This is W two ninety five AP. Choice 106.9 FM and 980 AM, WRNA, Guthrie's Pensacola, and on the World Web at www.wrna980.com. Time now, live for the Omar Neal Show. You're on the air. Well, thanks, Bob, and welcome again to the You've Got the Power Show. I am your host, Omar Neal. You know, um, you know, it, it, I always was told as a child that if it ain't one thing, it's another. And then they go on to say, if it ain't a sister, it's a brother. But the point of the matter is, you know, in the midst of, of a pandemic, we are dealing with multiple assaults uh, in the African-American community. As we, you know, we talked about uh, the Ahmaud uh, Arbery case in Georgia and just a horrific case where young uh, man was uh, jogging. Uh, he was assaulted by two uh, what they call uh, people who were doing citizen or citizen arrest, and of course he ended up losing his life. Well, in Minneapolis, uh, this just happened again. Another man. They said he was uh, passing some forgery, a uh, forgery uh, twenty dollar bill. He was um, arrested, handcuffed. They put his, uh, their knee on his neck to the point that he's no longer with us, he's dead. So I wanted to bring some people on because these assaults are perpetual, they, they don't end. But if we don't do something about them, I don't know what will happen to us in the future. And so let's talk a little bit about it. I, um, I, I have uh, with me today, um, uh, three individuals to whom I admire tremendously. Uh, Cedric Alexander, Dr. Cedric Alexander, who is the former president of Noble, that's the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. Uh, he's, uh, you see him on CNN, you probably read much of his writings. He's a prolific writer, uh, a commentator on many of the major networks, uh, but he's gonna be with us and, and we're gonna bring on uh, the current president of ABSI, the Association of Black Psychologists, uh, uh, Dr. Theopia uh, Jackson, uh, as well as the co-founder and past president of, of ABSI, uh, Dr. Wade Nobles. And so uh, we have what you call a star-studded group. Uh, welcome all to the You Got the Power show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, let, let me start with you, uh, uh, Dr. Alexander. You you train law enforcement. You you've been a police chief. You were president of the uh, the largest black law enforcement organization in this country. When you see situations like this, what do you see, and and why is this happening as as frequently as we're seeing it? Well, I think we have to go back uh, through the course of history. Uh, Omar, because if we think about it from the beginning, the policing in this country in particular, particularly as it relates to communities of color, there's always been this uh, adversarial relationships. And in particularly um, in communities where uh, many of us grew up, uh, and then we know that very well if we're baby boomers or older, uh, we know about segregation, we know about Jim Crow. And we also know that oftentimes police departments was used to keep one group of people on one side of town and one on the other and to enforce laws that were not on the book and certainly that were not constitutional. Uh, but we've come a long way in that regard over the number of years. And but yet there's still a lot to do. Uh, so let's go back to Michael Brown in 2014. I was currently at that time, I was, uh, the current president of Noble, and I spent a lot of time in Ferguson, in Baltimore, following uh, Freddie Gray as president of Noble and a, a host of other cities across the country, because if you can remember during that time, 2014, 15, 16, 
there just seemed to be one incident right behind the other. And also, I was an active police chief during that time in DeKalb County, Georgia, and also a, a trained psychologist. Uh, so for me, when I think about it, uh, on all those different domains, this is not anything new to us. The issue is, and the question becomes, when does this stop? And if we speak specifically to law enforcement, to where I spent over 40 years of my career, it is certainly was a major concern then, as it a major as it is a major concern now. Uh, but I will have to admit that even as my challenges as a chief, uh, I've had to meet some of those challenges that were questionable around certain deaths, and there were times when they were deemed as being legally justifiable, and then there was were times that we end up having officers arrested uh, who may have been involved in some. Uh, act of violence, and that was both black and white officers. Uh, but what we're seeing and what we're also sh struck by today uh, is the three incidents that really have overwhelmed our community over the last few weeks. And this is not new, but they punched us all in the face, and particularly in this COVID period. So if we go back to the Al uh, Albury case there in uh, South Georgia in, in, in Brunswick, which I had talked a lot about, uh, that was just an overt case of vigilantism, if you will. You can't call it anything other than that. And you had a small community there that appeared to and gave strong impression that they were gonna cover this up had that video not been exposed. But the bigger issue I have, Omar, even if that video had not been uh, turned, had not turned up, there should have been questions around that death that went that you didn't need a video to ask. That, those that part of the problem is, man, what we're doing is we're finding where if you don't have a video, we don't even have a case. People don't believe black people. That's, and, that's a problem. That's, and that's, that's a big problem. That's right. That's right, and, and it significantly has been a problem, and, and it's been in recent years that since uh, uh, these uh, uh, body police, body-worn cameras uh, have come into place that police officers now in many cities across this country are required to have, there's a lot of things we would not have seen and discovered. I can tell you that as a chief, as a former chief myself, uh, because I've seen reckless behavior, and I've also seen police officers who were accused of things that they did not do. I've seen that other side as well. Yeah. But if we stay to what we're talking about right now in the Albury case, well, our eyes didn't deceive any of us. It is exactly what we saw. And there is no question about that. It still will get a, 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 an investigation, but you saw the GBI come in in yeah. 36 hours or more made a case that that city could not make in two and a half months. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, uh, and, and the point of the matter is that's part of the problem. We don't have much confidence in the criminal justice system once people are uh, accused and, and uh, either uh, uh, indicted or whatever, that, that the system normally gives deference to police overly when when they're telling us don't believe our lying eyes let me go to dr jackson because this has to have some kind of psychological uh impact on the psyche of all black people uh that's walking around in black uh bodies i mean you we, we got we got uh three phds uh on this uh <laughs> on this uh on this uh show right but if mm -hmm. you walked around out there uh, with your blue jeans on and your t-shirt or uh, you would just be another black person uh, and and that's scary to a lot of people is that our bodies to many becomes a weapon they weaponize the blackness of a person is, is am I overly uh, stating that dr. Jackson or, or is, is that true first and foremost let me Thank you for this opportunity personally, because as a mother, as a sister, as a daughter, regardless, of, I want to put the PhD aside. The reality for me is I'm angry. I'm angry 
I'm angry. And I have a right to be angry. We have a right to be angry. I want to push back on the storiness of being calm. Instead, I would say, how do we use this anger for our own protection to move us forward? Also, I would say to you, for me, you may have underrepresented it because regardless of our degrees, regardless of our social economic status, regardless of our um, citizenship in this country, at any time and in any place, our blackness can be a threat to someone and simply by them fearing us gives them the right to kill us. Psychologically, they are, they are wounding us. Spiritually, our spirits are being wounded as we continue to get exposed to one more assault after the other. It's in our DNA, it's being reawakened. These are contemporary lynchings. This is still psychic terrorism. It's still communicating that there is a difference and that your humanity is not worthy to be acknowledged. You know, it's interesting, uh, Dr. Noble, uh, you know, you, you've been in the game a long time. You've seen this from a lot of different angles. Um, I, I, it's reminiscent of uh, Emmett Till and... Yes. Are the, you, you, it, does it harken, does it take you back to all of those spaces? And if so, are we dealing with post-traumatic stress collectively as a people? Is, are we in that space? Well, see, I think that we're, the answer is yes, we're in that space, but we also have to try to um, understand what we're really dealing with. Because yeah. what happens is that we, every instance becomes how do I explain this instance? How do I explain Emmett Till? Now, how do I explain the, in Michigan? How do I explain what's happening? You know, those instances should not be isolated. And, the, and, and I think what we have to do is, at some point, have the courage to ask ourselves, what kind of meaning has been perpetrated about blackness that allows those who consider themselves to be white they have full license to demean, to denigrate, to destroy blackness. Even once they become um, aligned with su supposedly the protectors of society in the, in the policing force, what happens to their mentality that uh, allows us to happen? I think that uh, this, uh, this pandemic has unleashed an underbelly of savagery, and I'm using that language very intentionally, an underbelly of savagery that allows almost anyone to assault black people for any reason and claim themselves to be innocent. Think about this. A man will shoot another man running away from him in his back and kill him, and then claim that he feared for his life. Mm -hmm. Well, he's carrying the gun. He's carrying the billy club. He's carrying the handcuffs. He's carrying the, the, the vehicle with a shotgun in it. But he claims he feared for his life. What is in the psyche of these people that when, when they are confronted with or even, uh, even meet in, a, in, a, in an informal way, blackness triggers a kind of psychosis, triggers a kind of and, and we use that language to psychotic psychosis, but I'm, I'm now more comfortable with using the language of savagery and bestiality because humans don't treat humans that way. And so we have to put this in the long term. And if I could make this one final point, you know, during, during our captivity and enslavement, it was intentional to define our people as less than human and then to use every every level of society to give every single individual white person the ability to validate our savagery. To, I'm sorry, to validate our inhumanity. Little boys calling old men boy. Uh, a, a woman being disrespected as if that's the normality of a, of a civilized society. So there's a, there's a long-term ingrained problem that we're confronted with and it shows up most clearly in the relationship between the black community and, and, the, and the police departments, but it's really between black people and, and all of our society. 
it's a lot it's a larger and deeper problem that we're looking at you know what's interesting i I wonder how much this the political divide in this country give rise to this kind of of indifference to human life uh said what were you thinking You, you think that maybe because we are the partisanship even when it comes to wearing a mask or not wearing a mask seems to be on some political divide do you think that that may attribute at all to what we are experiencing well you know I, you know I, you know i think dr nobles in many way uh, articulated much of the problem and much of this problem is truly rooted in history it's rooted in american history from the time we hit these shores and how we were seen and, and even how we were dealt with for 400 years and still to this day. Uh, but I also have to acknowledge this. Uh, we're seeing generational differences. We're seeing generational changes. We're seeing young people, young millennials, who most of us are baby boomers, I assume, maybe not uh, Dr. Yeah. Jackson, but most of us are baby boomers. And uh, we grew up in that segregated space for some period of time, right? Uh, but young people today, black and white, they appear to have a far greater sensitivity to differences uh, than maybe what prior generations may have had. And what, been what do you mean by that? I'm, I'm, I'm well, interested. I'm gonna get to that. I'm gonna get okay. to that in a moment. Okay. But but what I'm but but what I'm saying is here is that the only way we're going to get from there to here is going to happen over time. We can talk about it. But how is it going to be resolved is not going to be resolved, I think, just by merely us talking about it. But how do we get to it? What do we do that is going to be different? If you look under the Obama administration, to your question, Mm -hmm. if you look under the Obama administration and under this current administration, these same acts occurred and they occurred in administrations prior to that. There has been always been partisanship. It just appears to be much more intense as today than before. But we still got the same issues when it comes around relationships between communities of color and and, and police officers in this country. So So, so you you, you, go go, go ahead, go ahead. First and foremost, I appreciate what Cedric is bringing to the table, but I also want to take it a little deeper for me in the the sense that I would ask us to let go this this myth of post because nothing's post. This is persistent. It's intentional. It is in the DNA of America and much of the world that somehow um, our blackness threatens their sense of self, that they need to demean us in order to feel great. And now mind you, I don't want to be, I don't want to be distracted by, is this a global statement that represents everybody white? I don't want to be distracted by that. It is a real enough statement that people have been socialized into this ideology where even, quote, good intended white folks will talk themselves into, no, I didn't treat you that way because you are black. It's because you did something wrong in there. But, but they're not paying attention to the implicit bias, the messaging that's in there. So mm-hmm. they're all operating from that place. I also want to say, for me, this, um, these political divides are, are not the antecedents or contributing to it. They are a manifestation of this. That, there, that, that nothing has stopped. It's only taking on a different role, a different form. So even when I think about the multi-generational differences, and I am of the um, baby boomers, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> she looks um, good, huh? <laughs> yes, she does. Thank yes, you. she does. <laughs> I, would, I would respectfully say we have to critically look at what contributed to our, as, a, as the elders collectively, what contributed to our children, the millennials, not truly understanding who they are and, and, and buying into the myth that everything was cool and kosher and there's no more racial disparity. We all played a collective role in that. As we moved up and out to make it, we left our, our neighborhoods vulnerable. As we let other folks come in and teach our children, train our children, and we abdicate that responsibility, it has added to this, 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 this problematic message. So I'm going to close with this point to, to, that I see related to what Cedric is saying here, is that we are dealing with a, another form of madness. The same madness has always been there now. So the question becomes, in this global world of virtual connectedness, 
how do we collectively respond in a new way to an old problem, an you know, ongoing it, problem? You know, it's interesting that you said that. I want, I want to ask this question because I, I was always taught that what happens to you is based on two factors, your activity, something you do, or your passivity, something you allow. And, and that how much have Black people contributed to our own degradation, right? By not challenging systems enough to insist that these systems change. I think it was Frederick Douglass that says, power succeeds nothing without a demand. It never has and never will. Dr. Nobles, uh, tell me, if, is it any stuff, any stuff we can do about this? See, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of bothered with the difficulty of this problem. And um, um, we have to look at, if, if I, I, wrote, I wrote the source in the question of someone claiming the authority yes. to define who is human and who is not. And then all these demarcations that evolve out of that, like you know, the, the, the politicalization of democratic Democratic uh, Republic on a black white. All these, all these things become an expression of that hidden decision. And the hidden decision was that African people were not human. And if as not human, you can do any inhumane thing to them. Yep. And so everything else evolves out of that. And then we tried to figure out how do we uh, petition to power? How do we plead our case? And those issues are, are lost in the fact that it's almost like, and I, I hate to use this, but it's almost like I'm petitioning to a savage to be human or to treat me human. A savage only knows how to be a savage. So my appeal to respect my humanity is incomprehensible once their mentality has accepted that we are less than human. So all the atrocities, all the unbelievable treatment of black people during slavery and, Afri and then after can only be explained in a sense that people were operating out of this, um, this duality of human, not human. And you know, we, we, uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. Uh, I want you to finish that because I want to engage, I want to engage us in, the, in this conversation because this is and very have, important. And, and, and we have attempted to assert our humanity, assert the right to be treated as human, but the, the, the petition was sent to a place that didn't <laughs> comprehend what it means to be human. Right. So, so this, notion, this notion of, of, of having, and I don't want to stop you, Dr. Nobles, but this notion you know, of having rights and civil rights and laws and constitution, that means nothing? I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me give you an example. Let me give the relief. My understanding of our heritage, we are Bantu people. My understanding of our heritage is the Bantu said that to be human is to recognize the humanity of other, and in so doing, we, you are compelled to respond to them in humane ways. Where does rights come in there? Right. And you if see, I may. You see, it seems to me that the, 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 the rule of engagement is mm -hmm. not rights but responsibility. Mm -hmm. So how do I have a responsibility to care for and to share with others, as opposed to I have a right to take something from you? See, it's a, it's a, deeper, it's a deeper question that we have to look at, and I'm, and I'm really beginning to see a clear understanding of this dichotomy of human and not human. Mm. And I can, if, I can add, if I can add, Brother Omar, I would say too that your question I want to be clear, I want to, I want to state very clearly that no one can give us our rights or give us our humanity if we don't know who we are. And as you were phrasing the question earlier, I want to be careful here too. For me, a lot of this is internalized racism, that we have drank the Kool-Aid, that we have bought into someone else's image of what it means to, quote, be human, to be safe, to be real. And so we, and we put on that cloak as if, well, because I live at this zip code and have this type of notoriety in this circle, I'm not one of them. When at the end of the day, if we don't recognize our collective humanity as black people, regardless of these differences, then we are inadvertently colluding with our own demise because we are psychologically ill-prepared 
to recognize our own humanity and claim it and defend it. You know, Cedric, you and I both uh, were sworn officers, and we were sworn to protect all citizens equally, right? So, it, it, so it, in our training, at least in the training, it says that we there was no respect of person, right? I mean, so so how is it that 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 has not at least kicked in? as it relates to the performance of our duty as law enforcement. Let's, let me go to that space. Yes, that's a great question. You, you know, I can respond to that in a, uh, from a police perspective, if you will. That's where I spent 40 years of my life. Uh, and I think my two friends here can see it from a di very different place, in a much deeper place probably than I can. Uh, because I am probably marred and scarred uh, by being in this place of being a uh, defender of the public. See, I never, me personally, I never forget uh, that before I became a doctor, psychologist, psychology, before I became anything, I was born into this world in 1954 in Pensacola, Florida, as a black child who grew up to become a black man. I've had all the experiences that many of our people who have experienced over time, uh, but I also have been fortunate enough to have had opportunities like myself and my colleagues have had uh, to do greater things and hopefully be of some help to others. So I spent my life as a police officer uh, doing everything that I could and seeing many around me do everything that they could to make sure that people were treated fairly and people were treated according to this U.S. Constitution. And uh, I've seen good behavior on the part of my police colleagues. And I've seen behavior in which I, as a chief, had to discipline and even terminate people from. Uh, so my goal was then and still is to make sure that in this space and time that, that I have is that I do everything I can based on who I am and who I have become, both my strengths and my shortcomings, and probably even some of my own internalized racism, uh, just uh, growing up in America. But the most important thing we can do is try to become conscious of it and try to look into those spaces that we were not able to look into before and be able to say what is it that I'm that I'm not seeing or not hearing. Uh, there are a lot of good people in this world, and there are a lot of good people in this world that are black, and there's a lot of good people in this world that are from other cultures and races. Uh, but we have a historic issue in this country, and we cannot minimize it, and we cannot overlook it, as Dr. Jackson uh, uh, so eloquently stated. And for me as a lawman, a career lawman, who have to face oftentimes uh, families of color, or have to face a variety of different populations and explain to them the actions of my police officers, whether they were justified or not. Uh, and to be able to do it with a sense of compassion, a sense of, of, of care because I'm not really doing anything any different now being out of the profession I was doing and I was in the profession. And I was vocal about things then and I demanded uh, certain behaviors because I believe that it all starts at the top. Uh, and, but it comes to, in policing for me, there are several things that stand out for us to help try to make an immediate change. And I've been saying this for years. It's how we train, it's who we train, it's how we train, and it's how we supervise, and it's how we hold folks accountable. Because what we live in is what we live in at this very moment. So how do we make the space that yeah. we live in as fair and balanced as safe for everyone? And in, in, in understanding that we're still under this cloud of history, and people don't see us, some people don't see us as holy, maybe as others. But it's what is it that I'm capable or able to be able to do presently 
to try to affect some change and to make sure that everyone is treated fairly and equally. Let, 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 I want to I want to uh, piggyback on that. I'm I'm going to take one fork on, but I want to piggyback on that because when they see people like you, you and I talked earlier, and when we were talking about the Minneapolis case, uh, I we both said that I I saw a murder there. That's what I saw. Uh, I don't know what other people saw, but I saw a murder. Being a police officer, knowing once you've subdued a person and force is no, no longer necessary to effect an arrest, and you continue to uh, inflict uh, pain on a person to the point that they die, then that moves from being law enforcement to being a murderer. And there, there is a point of demarcation by which you lose the cloak of being a law enforcement officer. Let me let me let me do this. Let me go. Omar, quickly. Can I ask you this question quickly? Uh, can you murder a dog? Can you murder a pig? Can you murder a goat? If in your consciousness you believe that black people are not human, your violence is not judged the same way you judge the killing of another human being. And that's what we're missing here. The ingrained in this conversation is this question of who's human and who is not human. The not humans can be treated any way. I can shoot my dog if it bites me. I can shoot my cow if it doesn't give me milk. And no one gets enraged by that. Right. I want you to but, think but, about but, 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 but I would, but, but, but I would uh, uh, kind of see that a little bit different, Dr. Nobles, and I'm going to tell you why. And I agree with you. I see people have more respect for their dogs than what we saw happen. Now this is true. This what, people, what, okay. people, what people have more respect for their dogs? There, right. there's, there are certain yeah. states that have, yes. there are certain states that have yeah. more protection for animals more regards than children. Yes. for their dogs. Yes. Because had, 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 had we watched the video yes. of a dog being choked by any individual, they would be in jail today. And my brother said, you're making my point, they have yes. more respect for their dogs than they do for the humanity of black people. Now, yes. now, but but I'm going to flip that coin over. I'm going to flip that coin over. We also have people in our race who don't have respect for our own individual uh, uh, humanity either. People who, yeah. Uh, yeah. Our, our own folks True. who True. kill at the drop of a hat. True. No but respect again, or no regard. But again, let's not, like, you're right, but let's, let's not get distracted by that because what no, I'm, I'm not saying, getting distracted no, 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 by no, no, it, let me get right here. I make that point as a I moment. hear you. I hear you, but this is, for me, this is where these conversations tend to break down. Because as soon as we're trying to explicate the serious continual assault on black humanity, we turn over to that other conversation. And I think we're turning the page way too soon. Yeah, they're and, and I'm, and, yeah, I, I get it. They're connected, they're connected. If you put any group of people in the historical context that we've been in collectively for as long as we have, they too will start acting like the animals they've been set up to be. So I don't see these are not they do not just they they do not justify the other. Infected. Our, infected our people person. are infected with the disease, yes. and so therefore they act accordingly because the set because the setting has been put in place over four hundred plus years to be that way. You know, let let me bring but, in uh, Crystal. Crystal, uh, are you there? Because you this is Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, you all know about the uh, Terrence Crutcher uh, shooting there, and. Uh, and I, I want to I want to bring her in for a second. Crystal, how are you doing? Christy? I'm good. How are you, Mr. O'Neill? Good, good. Uh, Mr. Omar. <laughs> hey, hey, uh, you know, you know, we had the same uh, scenario uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, very similar. And, uh, you know, people are still sick. I mean, the 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 trauma, post-traumatic stress and trauma is still ravaging mm -hmm. your community. What happened to Terrence Crutcher, right? Yes, um, what happened with Terrence Crutcher really um, set, I think, a precedent for Tulsa um, to really challenge our police for our, our police uh, force, and it has our you know our good friend Dr. Tiffany Crutcher. She has been superior in making in demanding uh, police reform within our city and you know historically we have always had issues with our police here since the massacre uh even before the massacre um but 
yes, it, it has truly, it, it, it's been a challenge here in just trying to get an OIM here in Tulsa for police accountability. Um, and it's sad that we still have to do this. And, you know, what happened yesterday, um, it, it, it's a lot. It, it's a lot. It's a lot on our psyche. Tulsa woke up this morning, um, just like the rest of America, a Black America, in a state of not numbness, but really being sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so, you know, it, it's where do we go from here? Um, I was saying today, I don't want to do another march. I don't want to sign, I don't want to write another letter to our elected officials. I don't want to do another hashtag. And I don't want to even look at another video of our black men being murdered in the street. Um, and this is just a crazy time. And especially politically, um, you know, it's like we as black people, we look for these safe havens. We look for a safe haven even within our Democratic Party. But Amy Cooper, the lady who called on the, you know, called the police on that black man just asking her to put a leash on her dog, she donated to Obama's campaign. Minneapolis is a liberal uh, city. You know, a liberal state, when you look at that, what do we do? I mean, like, it's, it's, the time has come where we have to demand, not only demand change, but we have to enter into quid pro quo agreements. And we have to have a consequence to follow the demands that we make. Um, and until we get there, we're going to keep on this same cycle of insanity. And Brother Omar, you tell us all the time, you got the power. And I believe that we have the power. And um, that power is going to have to come from us. But I also believe it's going to start economically. Because we're going to have to pull our resources and our money together. We're going to have to buy our own politicians to challenge this police reform, this system. We have to do that if we are going to if we're going to dismantle white supremacy, and if we're and we have to take a we gonna have to take a tough stand with the police in this country because this is ridiculous. It, it is absolutely ridiculous. Now you're doing some things up in Tulsa in terms of Black Wall Street. A lot of people don't understand. You know, as as as, as Brother Wade was saying, there are a lot of times people don't understand our history and how it's keep on, you know, and it's just a, a perpetuation of assault. It's just a continuous assault on our humanity. Mm -hmm. and, the definition and, and, of persistent trauma. Persistent, and, and persistent trauma. trauma. People don't understand you can mm -hmm. never come, you can't heal if you're assaulting me. My wound can never heal while it's being perpetually, Ashe. while you're protect, protect, perpetually assaulting me. Okay. Right, people talking about get over it, get over it when you, you will get over it when you stop doing it, right? And and so, exactly. so, 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 talk a little bit about what you all are doing in Tulsa. I, I said I'll give you a minute to do that, so just say what you're doing in Tulsa, and then I'll get you back on to talk about it more extensively. Mm -hmm. We're having a reparations uh conference, a virtual conference. We wanted to do one physically, but because of COVID 19, we're not able to do that. So we have partnered with the ACLU, the Human Rights Watch. Um, so May 31st, the anniversary of the Tulsa, the 1921 Tulsa Rights Massacre, we're gonna have a serious discussion about reparations uh, for Tulsa. That will be the first half of it. And then the second half will be um, HR 40 and pushing HR 40. So we're looking at reparations, but one of the things too that we want to talk about is it uh, when we talk about reparations for Tulsa is also reparations, then what? Because it, it's been very important for myself and others to talk about reparations twofold. There's the internal reparations and your external reparations. And so, yes, we want to check. But we also want other things, other forms of reparations, land grants, to get some of the land back that was lost from Greenwood. Um, free tuition to college, you know, um, Oklahoma State University has a campus right in the heart of Greenwood. 
they sh- and, and you know we need to demand scholarships to to students there um, in our community. Um, so there, there's a lot of things that we're going to talk about, and also getting our minds our mindsets ready because once we get reparations, we don't want to go give it back to them. We want to build with it, and so the goal to create an economy within this economy because yeah. I do believe once we do that, that's the way we, because we have to get to a point where we are competitive and not just commodities. We have to be a competitive group of people um, and we, we need businesses, not just, you know, normal businesses, but we need to create industries so we can employ our own people. Um, and so that's, that, that's what we're going to be talking about. Well, How what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you back on, uh, you and Dr. Crutcher and, and all of the others. We're going to come back on and talk about it because that may be a part of the solution. Uh, Brother Wade is saying that, you know, you know, we got to come from some space where we do some things ourselves. We can't expect for other people to do it. We've done that before. That hadn't worked out mm-hmm. good for us. So there's some things that we got to do on our own. I don't necessarily, I'm, I don't know if I'm even encouraged as to whether or not it's doable based on what I'm hearing, mm-hmm. but, I, but I have to keep hope alive. It's just right. Like, Brother Omar, may I please respond to Sister Christie because I, I really appreciate what she brought to the table. Right. I, I think first and foremost, she gives a beautiful example we mean by the persistent trauma. And let's be very clear. These are traumas that came before we could name our most current family members who've been stolen from us. So each, one, each time these assaults happen, it reawakens that part of us from centuries before. I also want to say when we're, when we're talking about reparations, and I applaud those initiatives, that we should be clear, too, about the psychological, emotional, mental health rec, re, um, reparations as well. Spell those out very clearly, because Black psychology is doing its job in, in trying to promote a healthier sense of self based on who we are culturally and in response to the atrocities we're facing with. But the dominant health systems are not doing that. The American Psychological Association's theoretical approach and evidence-based practices are not designed to address this this depth of the issue. So for me, the reparation should have a broader holistic approach to it and demand that we have mental health services that are of us, from us, and for us in the context in which we live. Because to your point, that's what we need once we, quote, get whatever monetary or other um, physical things we get, we have to be back in our own right minds or we'll end up spinning. And then I'll close by saying, when I think about all the individual efforts that are happening at each state after such an atrocity happens, it occurs to me that we need to bring this at a national level. Whatever Tulsa's doing is working there, whatever's worked anywhere else, how do we create a national blueprint for this to be the case for all law enforcement and not wait until another atrocity happens? And to be clear, even when we have cameras and videos, they, t- they still tell us we don't see what we see. So that's still not a reality. I think <laughs> Brother Cedric said it very clearly. It's about how they train, who they train. It's a higher level. So I think, how can we learn from what's happening at each state level and make that the political national blueprint? And I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Let, let, let me say this. We've got tons of people on, on the line. So we're going to thanks, Chrissy, for, 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 for giving me a call. I appreciate you. Uh, uh, we, got, we got tons of people on. You all just chime in as you, as you see fit. Uh, let's go to 8483. You up next. You got the power. What's your comment? Good afternoon, Omar, and good afternoon to all your guests, uh, Dr. Alexander, who's in the same city I'm in. Uh, we're getting ready for a press conference at 1 o'clock at the King Plaza here because a 60-year-old white man took a set of keys as brass knuckles, punched a disabled black child in the face. Initially, when the deputy came out on February the 7th, he decided that no charges should be brought forth. The grandmother was outraged. She got a video. She went to the sheriff's department days later, demanded that something be done. He was arrested for aggravated assault on a 14-year-old child. When the case got to the state's attorney's office, the state attorney assistant decided no charges would be brought against this individual. As a former police officer, I'm demanding 
that that man, 60 years old, who hit this disabled child in front of the bus driver at a bus stop be arrested for aggravated battery? All right. I appreciate your phone call. You you see this these constant uh uh, uh you yes. know you know it, it's it's constant it's constant uh it's perpetual. Let's let's go let's go uh, fifty seven forty two fifty seven forty two. You need to cut your radio down. I have to mute you. Okay. Uh, um, let, let me say all my two. We should let go of saying black man, black woman, because <laughs> it's black from our babies to our elderly. There, there's no um, discrepancy here. And because sometimes when we also just say our black brothers, then we're missing the realities of what's happening to our sisters like Brianna, right? So we get, we get swept up again in not hearing all the voices. This is a collective assault on all of our blackness from even before we take our first breath based on the environmental conditions under which our people are forced to live. You know, one of the things is, now we have, you know, and, and Segre was saying this too, you know, you have good black people, you have good white people, and, and you use that term, something similar to that. I don't want to put words in your mouth. When we're talking to white people, do they get it? Do they understand what it's like to be walking around in black bodies? And and to be under perpetual assault, do they really get it? Maybe brother brother Wade, they, do they get it? How could they how could they understand it? One of the one of the the, the primary privilege of white privilege is the not to address and recognize their inhumanity towards us. So they they have a shield, literally a shield around them. That's their privilege. So th so we have to almost pierce the veil, break down the door appeal to them before they even recognize it. But they, but the walk around everyday ordinary person doesn't see or, or appreciate or understand the persistent trauma and terror that every day, all days, all little black people go through. You see, it's, it's, it's a deeper problem here. And I really want to keep stressing that, that we have to begin to engage in more deeper conversation. We should definitely uh, address every single atrocity that affects us in every level that we can as Malcolm said, by any means necessary. But we should also recognize that there are some tasks that we have, and there's some, in, in my mind, there's a task that white folks have. I'm using a blanket white folks. <laughs> I agree there are good white folks and good, but that's, 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 I don't have time to find out. My, 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 my barometer doesn't able to measure when's the good ones, when's the hot ones, what's the cold ones. So I yeah, think yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna lay out <laughs> Lay out this, yeah. this issue. But it seems but, but, to me, so let me finish. Yeah. It seems to me that we should be addressing white people. The only appeal we should make to white people is they have to heal the psychosis of okay. their white yeah. person. Yes. That's their job. Okay. They okay. have to, don't talk to me about what you can yes. do for me. You white folk have to heal yourself because there's a trauma, there's a, there's a pathology there that they're, they're not addressing. And we on our side, we have to ourselves. deal with the restoration of our wellness as African people. We can't just simply say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to suit up, be up, talk better, speak better, and white folks won't accept me. White acceptance is not even on the table. Right. Our humanity is on the table, and we have to restore that wellness. They have to be taught, as we did during slavery. We actually taught white folks how to be human. They just so, so, so I, you know, I have a question for you, Dr. Nobles. I hear you loud and clear. Uh, you say what they have to do and what we have to do. How is and that? Then we can come to. Then we can come how, together. How, it, it seems. See, my question has always been: How is that going to happen? If I was white and privileged, and you can't blame me for being white and privileged, I happen to be born into that. No more than you can blame me for being black and born into whatever I was born into. Uh, uh, see, 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 no, 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 let me finish. No, no, let me finish. How do you get your privilege? No, 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 but, but, no, no, but please, that's if, not what I'm saying. If you cheated but if you in the plan, then you don't deserve the privilege. If you cheated and stole and be, to get privilege, you don't deserve privilege. That's the conversation. You can't well, I still that. don't. Yeah, yeah, but I don't agree with that philosophically. And, well, I, and well, I don't agree well, with Cedric, that philosophically 
No, no, hold on. You, you guys got to let me speak. <laughs> you're good, you're good. No, I want to hear that. Hold, 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 hold up, Do Dr. Brother. Noble. Let, let, let him speak, and yeah. then, we'll, then we'll let you come okay. back. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. We all are born into where we're born into. I'm, I'm going to give you a good example. I was teaching at the University of Rochester the year before last, and I remember this young white girl walked in with her laptop at the University of Rochester, a prestigious institution, very prestigious, we're very well endowed. And she walked in there and on the back of her iPad, I could see she had Black Lives Matter. So as we began the class discussion, we were talking about some social issue. And here's what she said. She said, I grew up in this country very wealthy. She said, I grew up very wealthy and I feel bad about it that I grew up wealthy because I recognize everything that I have that other people don't have. She didn't say rich, she said wealthy. So my response to her is I would respond to anybody. Why should anybody feel guilty being born mm -hmm. wealthy. You wouldn't feel guilty being born wealthy, but here's what I did tell her. You have a responsibility knowing that you're endowed with wealth. You have a responsibility now to be conscious of it and be conscious of the people around you. I don't believe we can just demonize people merely because they are white or merely because they're born into wealth. I get the historical aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I understand the psychological aspect of it. But if we demonize every person that's out there who look different from us, we isolate ourselves because what is going to make them, Dr. Nobles, want to learn something different? When why do they have to? That becomes the question. Dr. Dr. And, and if we can't answer that question, then this just becomes a circular conversation. Dr. Nobles, can I restate Absolutely this right. to him? Because I think he's, if I can try speaking to him as, as one clinical psychologist to another clinical psychologist, because I think yeah. he's not hearing your, your primary point, Dr. Nobles. May I have permission to do that? Yes, yes. Okay. What I'm hearing Dr. Nobles say, and I can concur with completely, is that there's a dis-ease called the myth of black inferiority and the myth of white supremacy that has impacted everyone who's been born in this country. It's the disease, the dis-ease. What I hear Dr. Noble saying, and I agree with when I do the work that I do around multiculturalism, you have to go into your own, quote, small group conversations. White folks got to sit with white folks and better understand and hear each other around what, what they perceive as their white guilt, their white shame, their white blame, and their white racism. That's their conversation to have. While we need to have our family conversation around how we play out the internalized racism, why we can't see each other when our clothes don't look the same or when there's an African immigrant and we get, the, that's what I'm hearing Baba saying, Dr. Noble saying, when we have done the, let me finish please, when we have done those, then we can kind of come together as wholer, healthier people. History has taught us through the private thought, um, um, countercultural approaches to multiculturalism. When you simply bring white folks and black folks to the table, neither one is ready sometimes for that conversation because of the internal pain and the, and the depth of that psychological dis-ease. That's what I, I don't hear him demonizing anyway. What I heard him say very clearly and what I've learned from him, I agree with again wholeheartedly, is they've got to recognize that they are damaged as well because of that history. And how do they understand their damage? How do they speak to it? Like you said, those good white folks, what does that mean? It doesn't mean someone who simply says, I understand what you're going through and I'm sorry. I don't want your pity. No, and I don't want you to have to apologize for your wealth. My babies were born into wealth and they're black. That's not the issue, it's not about materialism. It's about the psychological social relationships. You have to sit with your family uh, and say, wait, where did our money come from? How much hatred did I listen to? How did I perpetuate all this degradation around gender, race, all kinds of things? That's their conversation to have. We have hours to have, then we can come together. Otherwise, you got all this intersectionality, I'll use that term for you, brother, all that intersectionality of oppression showing up, and you don't know what you're speaking to, and you're activating one another. You're perpetuating a sense of, 
of, of internal racism for me and, and, and white guilt for them. We're not ready for that. Go ahead. We need to be clear that th this conversation is not demonizing anybody. And, 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 and it, 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 it intrigues me that when you hear this conversation, someone goes to the place of you're demonizing me. That's symptomatic of the disease that they have. And so we have to begin to try to help each other, help each other to become whole. That's ultimately the goal, help each other become whole. I, want, I have to comment on uh, Cedric, your, 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 your laptop student. Uh, it, would have been, it would have been interesting if you had asked her, if you are guilty of your wealth, add up how much it is. If it is $30 million, you take $15 million and give it to the poorest black person you can find. Now, if she said that don't make any sense, ask her, why does it not make sense? I want to help them to, in, to internally understand what is happening with them, what, what prevents them from doing what the Bantus say. If you see a human, you are compelled to respond to them in humane ways. So if I see a black person and I kill him, I'm not responding to any humane ways. If I see a black child and I disregard them in the classroom because I'm a teacher, I'm not responding to them in humane ways. We have to change the conversation so that we can become whole. And I mean white people and black people. Black, and for that matter, Asian people. Look at what, look what the Chinese are doing to black folk. It's not just, it is white and black because everything else ripples out, ripples out of that. But the fact of the matter is that our goal, it seems to me, is to help humanity to become Period. whole again. Period. So, 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 this is, so this is obviously, uh, and we're coming up on the, the last minute. Can you imagine we did an hour this quick? <laughs> <laughs> An hour has gone by. I've only been here twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah that, you know, I, you know, I didn't tell you anything anyway. Too, you know, I let you stay. <laughs> you know, but you know, they said they say the time flies when you're having fun. I mean, so I mean, let's let's do this. The, the realize the realization is this: we must have a a deeper conversation. That what we're yes. seeing are symptoms of a deeper yes. problem. Yes. And 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 until we are willing to have that conversation with ourselves, as, 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 as Dr. Jackson is saying, uh, what you're even saying, uh, 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 Dr. Alexander, in, in terms of, you know, dealing with white people have to deal with some other stuff too. And, and, and Dr. Nobles, you are also saying that it's deeper than that. And we got to deal with the, the fundamental nature of humanity and what yes. constitutes Thank a human, you. right? Yes. I mean, I, I think, and then how do we incorporate that? How do we inculcate humanity in our people activity right in everything, everything. In everything, everything. In, in all people yeah. activity right so so but, but that, that has to be the conversation that we have because yeah. we can continue to look at the shiny objects like like what happened in minneapolis right or what happened in new york or what happened uh wherever it happens because it happens all all the time that those are symptoms. We got to look deeper. I'm yes. so appreciative for the conversation. This was absolutely incredible. Uh, we invite <laughs> you all. You you all have a standing. Uh, in, in, in in your 20 minutes is an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well. Let me say this. I am I I, I am more than delighted, and I am uh, at odds to be on this stage with uh, Dr. Noble and Dr. Jackson. I just have the greatest amount of respect for uh, their work and their passion uh, in, in the profession uh, and, and, and understanding it from uh, uh, a black space, uh, from American, uh, African-American space. And, uh, and I love when we agree and I also learn when we disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So I hope we, all have carried something away, but thank you for having the honor. And I thank you. Exactly. For Before we go off here, if I can speak for my president, I think ABC and Noble should go to, to continue with this conversation. I mean, these, these, I would are, agree. These, these are now yes. drive bys. Yes. These, these yes. Some, we have yes. a, a drive by. We don't need a drive by here. We need to have extended, continuous, deep That's conversations. Right. Right. And it seems to me that Noble, as the police officers in ABC, should figure out a way to have some deeper conversations Absolutely. after this moment. And yeah. let me also say too, if, we, if I can, I would be remiss if we didn't say this. I appreciate both you, Brother Cedric and Brother Omar, and all of our black and brown law enforcement folks 
who sat in that very difficult space of being part of a system that has social that, that, that attempts to socialize them into the dehumanization of others, attempts to, while you're holding on to your sanity there, as well as when you show up in the communities and our communities don't recognize you because of the uniform you wear. So I want to make sure that, that intersectionality is also heavy on my heart too. Yeah. As are the, the white folks who who are a little bit more woke, but their being woke costs them as well too. We know many lives are lost during the civil rights moment as, as well too. This is what I mean by the collective dis-ease that we're dealing with on a systemic issue. Our conversations here today, for me, were not disagreements. They were the complexities of the situation that we're in. Absolutely. And we're constantly to learn from one another and not be distracted into this temptation of an either or stance and say that both end. Because by the time we analyze the both end, we will land back into the myth of black inferiority and the myth of white supremacy and that epistemological groundedness of the, of the air we breathe in this place called United States of America. Well, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't have ended my show any better than that. So I know <laughs> it's a benediction. <laughs> let me, let me thank you all for uh, Dr. Jackson, Dr. Nobles, Dr. Alexander. Thank you all so much. Uh, for well, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Absolutely, I say, and we will be in touch, Brother Cedric all right, and Brother please. Omar. Yes. Let's continue. Hit me talk. up on Facebook. Let's connect. Absolutely. Yes. And let me connect with you too, Dr. Nobles. Absolutely. Okay. I would love Absolutely. that. Let's, My let's, brother let's, was a police officer. My brother was an Oakland police officer. So you all in the family for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that would right. work. So, so I'd like to thank you all for joining with us on this segment of You've Got the Power. And of course, you can support this program by sending your checks and money orders in care of You Got the Power at P.O. Box 146, Tuskegee, Alabama, 36087. Also, uh, you can sort of support us uh, on Facebook with uh, our Cash App as well as PayPal. As always, I'd like to leave you with these two words. Remember that I love you with a perfect love, but more importantly, remember this. You got the power. We'll see you next week, same time, same station. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.